This week is our third and final week of a series that we've been doing called Inbox, looking at these messages from God, and specifically the letters in the New Testament that we have received, like we received something in our inbox. We've been looking at those New Testament letters and what they have been telling us that we need to delete or get rid of in our lives. And I don't know about you, but this has not been my favorite sermon series. I don't like to hear or to tell you about what you ought to get rid of in your life, right? That's no fun. I'm not really sure I want to, like the first week, delete my entitlement. And as good as it sounds from last week, I don't know if I really want to delete my shame. It comes in handy as a pretty good excuse. And I certainly today don't want to talk about deleting our self-reliance. It's a hard thing to do. We're so used to feeling like we have to just rely on ourselves and nobody else. But God always challenges us. God challenges us, and a lot of those big challenges come from the book of James that we will read together today. From James chapter 5, verse 13 through 20, will you hear the word of the Lord? Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if any among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that in the midst of our suffering, you were there hearing our prayers. That in the midst of our joy, you help us to break into those songs of praise. We thank you that when healing is needed, you have given us your very presence and your community of the church to walk alongside us and pray for us. We thank you that when we were wandering, you sent someone after us. And so, Lord, today, help us. Help us, because this is difficult for us. Help us to rely on you, and as you've designed, to rely on each other. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Now, I told you that I wasn't real thrilled about trying to preach on deleting our self-reliance. After all, self-reliance is a big theme that we have been told that we ought to be able to do, right? We ought to be able to rely on ourselves and not need anyone else, being self-sufficient, raising ourselves up. This is the kind of stuff that's bred into us as a part of our American DNA of doing it ourselves and raising ourselves up, relying on ourselves. And so it's kind of hard to talk about how God has designed us to rely on God and on each other. Because we like to just trust and rely on ourselves. It's something that is, goes deep in our culture. 
And if you're a red-blooded American like me, you just really want to trust in yourself and really only would rely on yourself. We can tell stories, you know, I'm not planning on running for political office ever, but if I was, I could tell some pretty good stories of my ancestors, you know, who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and out of sharecropping and into running successful businesses, or about my grandmother's parents who came over as immigrants from England and worked in the mines and worked hard and made a better life for themselves. We have this idea that if we rely on ourselves and work hard, we can make anything happen. And there's a lot good about that. It's good to be self-responsible. It's good to be responsible for ourselves and do the things that we need to do and to take care of ourselves. All those are good things, but we tend to take them a step further and instead make it where we just want to rely on us and no one else. Now, this morning when I woke up, I was thinking about self-reliance. I have, after all this week, prepared a sermon on how we ought to rely on God and on our community of faith and not just on ourselves. But this morning when I woke up, Man, this is so deeply in us. This morning when I woke up, you know, Pastor Lolita is out of town today. She couldn't be here. I have all of the kids. She told me that I needed somebody to help me with the kids on Sunday morning because we have lots of extra things happening. But when I woke up this morning, I thought, I don't need this help that I've arranged. I can make this happen. I can prepare for two worship services preach two sermons and teach Sunday school and take care of all the details and all the people and watch the three kids all at once. I can do this. I don't need the help. I had this internal dialogue with myself all morning long. And let me tell you, if I wasn't preaching a sermon about not relying on myself, I would have tried it. I would have said, I don't need the help. Thanks for offering, but I don't need it. But, you know, as usual, My wife was correct, God was correct, and I haven't done such a good job just keeping myself together. But it runs deep. We want to just rely on ourselves and not need anyone else. But that just isn't the way the world works or the way that God has designed us. God has designed us to rely on others. And if I'm honest with myself, I know that those stories we tell ourselves about how we ought to be, how we ought to be self-reliant, well, I know that my ancestors, they had a deep faith in God. They didn't do it all by themselves. They had a community of faith that they leaned on and family they leaned on in times of trouble. They didn't just raise themselves up out of a different way of life to a better way of life. They lived by principles they learned in the Methodist church to get an education and to work hard and to care for others and to keep their nose clean. They did it in community, relying on one another and relying on God. We can make up all the stories we want about how great it would need to be just to rely on ourselves, but it always has been and it always will be that we can't be self-reliant. We need God. We need each other. We need each other. In his book called A Simple Guide to Prayer, Pete Gregg tells a story about, I've been using this prayer for our prayer course, he, he, he talks about his son. How when his son was little, he was praying with his son before bed, and he was praying all the things parents normally pray for their kids before they go to bed. And he prayed one night that his son would be a Christian when he grew up. And his son, he tells him the story, stops him in the middle of the prayer and says, but I don't want to be a Christian when I grow up. And that's not you know, what the parent wants to hear, right? And so he, so he asks him, Well, why don't you want to be a Christian when you grow up? And the the boy responds to him, Because I want to be Batman when I grow up. 
And he says he tried to reassure his son that he could be both. He could both be Batman and be a Christian when he got bigger. But the truth is still the truth for a lot of us as adults as well, isn't it? We want to be a Christian, but we also want to be a superhero, right? We also want to do all the things, and we want to take care of ourselves. We don't want to depend on anybody else. We want to preach all the sermons and teach the Sunday school class and take care of the kids at the same time just to prove that we can do it. We want to be superheroes and be Christians and maybe sometimes we can do that, but often at times, well, we can't be both reliant totally on ourselves and on God. We are not, after all, in the story, the superhero, and God calls us to be with God and with each other. The book of James talks about this. The book of James is a challenging book. It's so challenging to the way that we live and the way that we think that the great reformer Martin Luther wasn't a big fan of the book of James. He kind of thought maybe it wasn't as good as the rest of the Bible. But James simply tells us like it is that our faith and the way that we live or our works, what we do, go together in powerful ways. James tells us things like he does here in chapter 5 that it doesn't all come down to us. Our faith isn't about us. It isn't just about making us a better person or saving us, but that indeed our faith is about this God that we have to rely on if we're going to make it through this community of faith, the church that God creates, that we're going to need one another to make it through. James reminds us that there will be suffering. Are any among you suffering, he writes. They should pray. And of course, there is suffering in our world, right? Right? There are things that are just beyond our control as badly as we don't want to admit it. There is disease and sickness. There are circumstances that we weren't put in charge of and we can't seem to get our hands around. There are times that our lives seem out of control and suffering is real. We try to control our circumstances, but sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't even really do a very good job of controlling how we're thinking or how we're feeling. Suffering is real, and when there is suffering, we need to pray. When things are out of our control, we turn to the one for whom nothing is too big of a challenge. We turn to God. God who is in control, who is bigger than our problems and our suffering and our sin and our brokenness, we rely on God. We rely on the God who can and we pray. We pray. Now the English word to pray comes from the same Latin word. This root word is the same word as the word precarious. Precarious. And we pray because life is precarious. Because life isn't all put together. There is suffering and unknown and things that are out of our control. We pray because life is precarious and out of our self reliance and self control. We pray because this God is here with us and we can rely on God. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times where I think that I got things under control. If I just did this, and I do that, and I make sure this happens, and that person doesn't do that, and I've got the little plan, right, that will make things work out for me. You ever do that? But the truth is, there's been so many things that have happened in my life good things that I can't take any credit for and I just have to say that was God 
That was God working that out. That wasn't my great plan. That wasn't this or that. This forgiveness, this love, this grace, this thing that has happened, these people I get to be with, that wasn't me. That was the God who can, the God who meets with us in our suffering and our out-of-controlness and brings us grace. We can't rely on ourselves totally. And so we rely on God. When we are suffering, we should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Just like there's suffering in the world, there is joy in the world too. There is joy in the world because God is here with us. There's joy because we don't have to work everything out, but God has already saved us. God has already sent Jesus to forgive us, to come and make all things new. There is joy that surprises us. Sometimes in moments of just a spiritual high, we'll feel joy, and then sometimes just out of the natural things we enjoy in life, joy will come, and we will look back and we will say, well, that was God at work in that moment of joy. In the world's estimation, after all, we know that there is suffering. We know that things are broken. We know that we can't control the outcome, even though we'd really like to. We know that death is the end in the world's way. But because of Jesus, death is no longer the end. Suffering no longer wins, and there is joy. There is reason to sing. There is reason to when we get together as the body of Christ, we do something that's really weird for people coming together to do. We sing together. We have joy together. It may not quite be like a musical, you know, when people just break into song out of joy, and you really don't want me doing that anyways. But it is the fact that God's joy breaks into the world. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Praise because it's God who brings us the joy. Praise because we experience that joy together. Are any among you sick? James asks next. They should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over them. The prayer of faith will save the sick. You notice here this is not a time when, in the face of sickness, in the face of the need of healing, this is not one of those times that Jesus says, well, go lock yourself in the prayer closet and pray there by yourself. This is a time, James tells us, we ought to seek other people out to pray for us. We ought to seek the church out to pray for us. We ought to seek out the leaders of the church to pray for us. We ought to pray together for healing. We ought not just try to rely on our Ourselves, but we ought to rely on God and on God's people. Let us pray for each other. You see, we have a world that needs healing. We have lives that need healing. Physical, emotional, spiritual, run the list down. We need healing. And the scriptures direct us that if we need healing, we need God in prayer, and we need each other to be praying for us. We can indeed be a healing church when we depend on one another, when we know that the answer and the solution is out of my control, out of your control, but together we can seek God and God's presence. We're a church that prays, a church that sings, a church that heals, a church that cares. You notice this last part, the last few verses that we read together this morning, James talks about if anyone wanders from the truth and somebody brings them back, then that person helps to save that person's soul. Notice, again, it's not just one person saving themselves, but it's God doing the work and others coming alongside. And if we're honest with ourselves, we all spend a little bit of time wandering, don't we? We all spend some time wandering. For some people, their wandering is like really obvious to everyone else, right? 
It's really public, and they do some really dumb things, and we're really wondering why they're wandering. For others of us, our wandering is a little more subtle and hidden, right? Maybe we haven't even told anybody, but we've been struggling with doubt and fear and the unknown. But our scripture lesson today tells us that when we go and we seek out the wandering, when we help bring them back to God, that's an incredible thing. That's the sort of thing that Jesus does, right? Jesus, who tells this parable about the good shepherd leaving the 99 sheep to go and seek out and find the one who was wandering away, the one who was lost. And brothers and sisters, we are called when we feel like we're wandering. Not to just be self-reliant and think we can get ourselves up out of the mess and find God ourselves. But we're called to let those people who have come searching for us help us. And we're called to be those people for others that help them back to God. You know, so often we go wandering in faith and doubt and sin we go wandering because we're trying to do it all ourselves. We're trying to just to be self-reliant and work it all out ourselves, make ourselves happy, make ourselves feel full of joy, heal ourselves, end our own suffering. We try to take care of it all ourselves, and we end up wandering. And the very way that God brings us back demonstrates to us that we can't be doing that. That we need to rely on God and on each other because somebody, somebody comes looking for us. Sent by God. And in turn, we go help others once we're found. So yeah, I'd rather not preach a sermon about not being self-reliant because you don't want to hear it and I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I want to take care of myself. So often we want to take care of ourselves. But the truth is, is that we need God. We need each other. We can't save ourselves. We can't heal ourselves. We can't end our own suffering. We can't be a superhero. But we can rely on God. This God who came and sought us and found us and is making us new. And so today, brothers and sisters, whatever it is, whatever piece of control that you're hanging on to, whatever inner dialogue you're having about doing it yourself, turn it over to God today. Turn it over to God, because we were made to rely on Him and each other. Let's be God's people together. We say to ourselves, I want to be a Batman and I want to be a Christian. But Jesus just simply invites us to be found, to trust, and to rely on God. And so today, as we come to the communion table, we do just that. Our very being in worship today, showing up, is a sign that we know that we need God and we need each other. And as we come to the table, as we eat together, as we're a family together, as we're fed together, we rely on God. We take Jesus into ourselves. We take it in the company of each other. And we are changed. We are changed Lord God we know and sense your presence with us this morning we need you deeply we need you Lord God we confess God that we're trying to hold it all together we're trying to do all the things. We're trying just to trust ourselves and no one else. But we need you, Lord God. So come and meet with us today. Open us up to you. 
to relationship with you through prayer, to the joy that you bring, to the healing that's possible, to the wholeness of our community that's possible. Here we are, Good Shepherd. Find us, we pray. Amen.